answer was D that all of the above, all the three names, they were a part of the group who had come up with the ASA classification. So we have Dr. Vishali Gupta. She's the person who has rightly answered them in the shortest uh, time frame. Congratulations. So now quickly moving on to the next session, which is a long case presentation of a 36 year old female with a BMI of 48 kg per meter square posted for sleeve gastrectomy. I would like to invite the Your voice was not clear. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Okay. I just introduced you, ma'am. Okay, all right. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, ma'am. So uh, we have the next, we have uh, as, as moderate, morning, we have Dr. Uh, uh, Anupma Gil Sharma. Ma'am is Associate Professor at APBMS in Dr. RML Hospital, New Delhi. And ma'am's area of special interests are critical care, difficult area management, regional blocks, and transplant anesthesia. Welcome, welcome ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. The case will be presented by the final year PG student, Dr. Diti Priyanka. She's the final year postgraduate student at ABVMS and Dr. RML Hospital, New Delhi. So I hand over the proceedings of the session to you, ma'am. Sure. Hi, Deepti. Good morning. Morning, ma'am. Yeah, you can start. Good morning, everyone. A 36 year old female patient by name Afsa Parveen, a resident of Preet Vihar, New Delhi, occupation oh. housewife. Deepti, is Deepti, just a minute. Uh, I just wanted to explain how we are going to go about it. So just like in the exams, I'm going to be interrupting you after each present, after each uh, part of your uh, presentation and ask you questions. Okay. So I'm not uh, going to ask you to finish the whole presentation and then we'll do the discussion. So after your um, history presentation, I'll ask you a set of questions. Then similarly, after finishing your examination and later on investigations and perioperative management. So we'll, the flow is going to go like that, right? Are you all right with it? Fine. Yeah, okay, now you can start. 36 year old female patient, Afsa Parveen, resident of Preet Vihar, occupation housewife and her religion is Muslim, presented with chief complaints of progressive weight gain since eight years, loud snoring since six months. Uh, her, Patient was apparently normal eight years back until she started gaining weight. Weight gain was gradual and progressive over eight years. Increased intake of food is present. Increased duration of sleep is present. She gained a total weight of 35 kgs. Her, her current weight is 100 kgs associated with lethargy. Her main complaint is main weight gain in lower abdomen, hip and thigh areas. Snoring since past months and faint in intensity initially. Now snows for most of the night loud enough to be heard across closed doors, aggravated by lying supine, slightly relieved by lying head up on two pillows. No history of sudden awakening from sleep, early morning headaches or sleep uh, daytime sleepiness. No history of blackish discoloration of neck, axilla or bluish marks over abdomen. No history of intake of medications like oral contraceptive pills, steroids, antidepressants. No history of breathlessness, chest pain, palpitations or syncopal attacks. No history of cramping, pain, or swelling in legs. No history of heartburn, regurgitation, right upper quadrant pain. No history of joint pain and back pain. Past history, she is a known case of hypothyroid since past 10 years, controlled on medication. Known case of hypertension since past 10, 5 years, controlled on medication. Deepthi, just a minute. Before we go on to the past history, can you tell me why you elicited all this negative history? Uh, Ma'am... Uh, 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 there is no history of sudden awakening from sleep and early morning headaches to rule out uh, symptoms of OSA, ma'am. And okay. uh, no history of blackish discoloration of neck and axilla or bluish marks or abdomen to rule out uh, uh, polycystic ovarian disease, ma'am. In that disease, there will be acanthosis nigrans. Okay. Uh, there is no uh, 
history of medications like oral contraceptive pills, steroids, or antidepressants, which causes weight gain, ma'am. Okay. And uh, breathlessness, chest pain, palpitations, or syncopal attacks to uh, rule out any history of uh, uh, cardiac or uh, cardiac diseases. And no history of cramping, pain, or swelling in legs to rule out uh, varicose veins or uh, DVT. And no history of heartburn, regurgitation, or right upper quadrant pain to rule out any GARD, symptoms of GARD. Correct. correct. And no history of joint pains or back pains because of weight uh, bearing on the joints. There will be osteoarthritis, ma'am. So can, all can you go back one slide? Can you go back one slide? Yeah, so in the history where you're eliciting the snoring, do you think you need to ask anything else besides what you already asked? Do you think you need to ask about uh, sudden, uh, I mean, the, the person who's sleeping next to her, if they have observed her, you know, stopped breathing or, you know, and is suddenly restless and wakes up, even though the patient may not remember the awakenings, the partner who's sleeping with that patient or whoever is sleeping next to that patient will notice this. So it is uh, because the O part of the stop bang is, is, is uh, important in the sense that if other people who are in the family are observing these kind of uh, awakenings or the patient uh, or apnea spells, so to say, at night. So that you should elicit also and note down in your history. Okay. Yeah. Carry on. Past history, she is a known case of hypothyroid since 10 years controlled on medication. Hypertension since past five years controlled on medication. No history of diabetes, diabetes uh, TB, diabetes mellitus, bronchial asthma or any psychiatric illness. No history of any surgery, previous anesthetic exposure or blood transfusions. Treatment history for past 10 years, patient is on tablet thyroxine 75 micrograms OD. Uh, for past five years, patient is on tablet amlodipine 5 mg and tablet telmisartan 40 mg OD and is complained to treatment. Patient has tried reducing weight by means of diet restriction and exercise few times before but failed in losing weight. Apart from that, she has not taken any treatment for weight gain. Family history, no family history of obesity, no similar complaints in parents or siblings. She is married, having two children, eight-year-old son and five-year-old daughter. Her husband is an auto driver. She is a non-vegetarian, non-alcoholic and non-smoker. She is having regular bowel and bladder habits. She belongs to lower, social, lower middle class. Her menstrual history, menarche at 13 years of age. Menstrual cycle is regular with normal flow lasting for three to four days. Her LMP is 10th November 2022. Obstetric history, para 2, live 2 with full-term normal vaginal delivery at a hospital. Coming to general physical examination, patient concern wait, was taken. Wait, wait, deep, deep. Do you think you need to ask any more questions in your uh, history with regard to the surgery that she is scheduled for? When you are doing asking a history as an anesthetist, what are you looking for? If you know that purpose, you are going to ask the right questions. As an anesthetist, why do you need to take the history? The, the, to know the diagnosis is already established, right? So here, going and taking the history, how is it going to help you manage your anesthetic? So that should be your main motive of asking the right kind of questions, okay? Or how you plan to ask your questions so that you can tailor make your anesthetic so that the patient's outcome or safety profile increases right so any other thing that you would like to ask in this patient which means that you are ruling out all the diseases that are commonly associated with obesity right so have you ruled out everything Ma'am, uh, we should ask any history coming to respiratory system we should ask any uh, uh, history of uh, obstetric sleep, obstructive sleep apnea. That you've done. Obesity. That you've done already. That's in good. The, what else? What in else? The CVS will ask any history of CAD, ma'am. Am oh. I any history? There, of we are still on the respiratory system. In the respiratory system, do you need to ask any other history? So here you need also these patients often have uh, respiratory diseases such as asthma and COPD. 
right so you need to ask history specifically to elicit uh, underlying conditions such as asthma so that you ask have to ask the patient do you have episodes of wheezing or whistling in your respiration which can point you towards asthma okay so that is one and uh, what else what else in respiratory system the dyspnea if she has dyspnea during her routine work or when she is doing exercise or any kind of uh, increased work so that is very important to elicit so that her cardio respiratory uh, uh, profile can be evaluated right okay and in, in the cardiac what what do you need to rule out so they should rule out uh, any history of uh, cad ma'am any history of mi and no, so they, uh, often these patients will not give you history uh, of mi or uh, cad so you'll have to elicit during your history taking so what questions are you going to ask we'll ask any history of chest pain ma'am right uh, any vocal attacks okay besides beside coronary artery disease any other things which are commonly associated any cardiovascular CVA. sorry cva history of cva or right. anything else and uh, m uh, so you have to, no so you also have to ask that you already asked but you also have to ask they these people stand a very high risk of arrhythmias so you have to ask history of palpitations or missed heartbeats you know or uncomfortable feeling behind the chest so this will give you pointers to towards uh, underlying arrhythmias right so these are the important things that you should ask any other uh, associated uh, diseases in these these in this group of patients besides uh and endocrine ma'am coming to endocrine they will be having hypothyroid ma'am cushing's disease diabetes they will be having ma'am no cushing's is a separate disease entity altogether okay which in which the patients might be obese but here this is a patient who is coming to you for obesity surgery so uh, diabetes is yes so you basically have to rule out all the um, conditions or diseases which are related to a metabolic syndrome right so uh, of which cardiac and respiratory are of most importance because that is those are the things that are going to affect your perioperative outcome right okay fine now you can move on to the uh, examination patient concerned was taken patient was conscious cooperative and well oriented to time place and person she was comfortably sitting in a chair her weight is 100 kg height is 155 cm bmi is 40 1.6 kg per meter square waist circumference is 90 cm hip circumference is 100 cm waist to hip ratio is 0.9 how is this important deepthi how is this important waist waist to hip ratio in males if it is more than 1 and in females if it is more than 0.8 it points out towards uh, ischemic heart diseases cad and uh, outcome of your our surgery also depend on uh, ways to hip ratio ma'am so uh, in other words just uh, the bmi alone does not define the risk so what defines the risk distribution of fat correct very good so the distribution of fat central obesity is more associated with cardiovascular disease metabolic syndrome because the visceral fat is the one that is responsible for release of inflammatory mediators which lead to all these disease processes like hypertension coronary artery disease diabetes hyperlipidemia so that is why this is more important whereas uh, and central obesity is generally seen in males mostly you can find it in females also and it is also called an android obesity whereas uh, peripheral fat deposition is seen mostly in females and it is associated less with the uh, incidence of metabolic syndrome okay so that is how this is important important just not the bmi alone all right okay carry on the pulse rate is 98 beats per minute right radial artery regular good in volume and character radio radial and radio femoral delay is not there all uh, peripheral pulse is palpable her bp is 140 by 88 mm of hg measured in right upper arm in sitting position appropriate with appropriate sized cuff respiratory rate is 16 breaths per minute regular abdominothoracic 
saturation is 97% on room air her temperature is epipryl no why, why the saturation how is saturation important here um, uh, these patients will be having hypoxemia ma'am so uh, uh, resting hypoxemia so we have to check saturation baseline saturation of the patient so how, so say this patient had a saturation of 94% on room air what will you do ma'am we'll uh, get uh, get the uh, uh, pft is done ma'am we'll rule out uh, any obstructive oh. or restrictive pattern of the disease in other words the saturation monitoring during examination will help you optimize the patient order more investigation and optimize the patient before taking up for surgery because bariatric surgery is an elective surgery okay it's not an emergency surgery so you want to maximize your patient's optimization before scheduling for surgery so that the post op complications are less right so that is why it is important to see the saturation if the saturation is less than 95% you need to do a set of investigations to rule out the underlying causes and if possible optimize it and if you are not able to optimize it because of the obesity then you will take extra care in the post operative period to prevent the complications of this decrease in saturation right yeah okay carry on temperature febrile no paler serous clubbing cyanosis lymphadenopathy were noted edema was not present jvp was not raised venous access appears to be difficult airway examination no visible maxillofacial abnormality no apparent deformity of nose cheeks both nostrils patent dentition no loose bugged missing or artificial tooth good oral and dental hygiene mouth opening more than 5 cm modified malampati grade 3 large tongue and double chin present calder's test lower incisors anterior to the upper jaw that is normal functionality of the temporomandibular joint upper lip bite test class 1 neck circumference 40 cm slight hump seen over the back of neck neck movement normal as demonstrated by delicans test hyomental distance is 6 cm thyromental distance 6.5 centimeters sternomental distance is 12.5 centimeters cricoid cartilage is palpable large breast present okay so this Cardio airway wait wait deepthi you are <laughs> haven't finished this part so uh, what does this airway examination tell you ma'am uh, this go back uh, go back ma'am airway examination will uh, rule out whether patient in this patient yeah yeah Yes, ma'am. She is having fatty deposition over the neck, ma'am. Okay. Uh, double chin is present and large tongue is present, which pre, uh, which is an indicator for difficult bag mask ventilation and uh, difficult laryngoscopy. And so what uh, are the what are the indicators in this patient for a difficult bag mask ventilation? Ma'am, patient uh, bag mask ventilation patient is obese, ma'am. Neck circumference is more than forty centimeters, ma'am, and uh, she is having large tongue ma'am no which is the first parameter which tells you that this patient is difficult to would be difficult to ventilate presence just not bmi what is the main in this patient this patient has that history of snoring right history of snoring is a very important indicator of difficulty in bag mask ventilation and if the patient has osa that even exaggerates the difficulty right so that is number one what else what else why do you need to be very sure of your airway examination in this in this patient in all obese patients how does it matter do all obese patients have difficult intubation first question why why ma'am uh, it depends on the deposition of fat uh, in intra uh, in inside the mouth and extra extra luminal and intra luminal fat deposition ma'am so it depends on that if extra luminal fat is uh, deposited there will be difficulty in uh, laryngoscopy so the fat deposition uh, at the nape of the neck uh, the base of the neck can can be taken care of by doing what ram position ma'am we Correct. put a ram so that is taken care of so then how you how will you know that this patient might have difficulty in intubation what how does how does one reach that conclusion vis a vis normal patients non obese patients 
so the the point of asking this question is that like i said the intubation in an obese patient is not difficult but is difficult only if they have other parameters as in non obese patients so it is important so the only difficult thing here is with if the patient has a difficult airway according to whatever examinations you have done you have very little apnea time in this patient so that adds to the difficulty okay per se these patients do not have most of these patients will not have a difficult intubation right so you have to keep this in mind and therefore airway examination is very important so that even if you have a slight indication of or any parameter which suggests difficult intubation you keep all your equipment ready you have extra help so that you avoid the complications of a difficult intubation right got it okay go back to the next uh, next slide okay here like you said next of no, circumference is one parameter which can indicate towards a difficult intubation right anything else everything else is normal so do you think this patient will have difficult intubation maybe she might have i'm not sure okay okay fine chalo carry on coming to cardiovascular examination on inspection no precordial bulge no visible pulsations no venous deformities apex beat not visible no scars sinuses dilated veins in any part of thorax on palpation inspectory findings were confirmed apex beat not palpable no palpable thrill parasternal heave or pulsations over chest on percussion cardiac borders could not be adequately appreciated auscultation s1 and hs2 heard in fifth intercostal space 1 cm medial to mid clavicular line no murmurs heard so what are you trying to see in the cardiovascular system more importantly here ma'am we uh, we'll see any uh, uh, see, what are you uh, trying to rule out ma'am any uh, arrhythmias we'll rule out ma'am okay Uh, and uh, in signs of congestive heart failure will rule out ma'am correct which is which is what s3 and s4 presence of s3 and s4 and basal crepitations on auscultation of the lung okay so those could point you towards uh, signs of heart failure right which can be seen in these patients okay go on so whenever in the exam you are saying a systemic examination you should know what you are trying to look for okay instead of rattling off shape normal this normal which you are anyway not doing if you know what you are looking for in that system your your concepts are going to be very clear so that nothing is missed okay and your anesthetic management is adequate right okay carry on respiratory system on inspection shape of the chest appears to be normal trachea appear to be central respiratory rate 16 breaths per minute regular abdominal thoracic bilateral chest movements equal no visible swelling scars venous pulsations over chest wall no audible wheeze or strider no usage of accessory muscles of respiration on palpation inspectory findings confirm surface temperature is normal tracheal position in midline no tenderness no bony deformity bilateral equal movements of chest wall present vocal perimeter is normal and equal chest expansion on full inspiration is 3 cm diameter ap uh, antero posterior 42 cm transverse 54 cm on end of inspiration 39 cm and 51 cm transverse on end of expiration on percussion reduced resonant note in all areas auscultation bilateral vesicular breath sounds in all areas no added sound vocal resonance normal so if this patient has a wheeze or ronchi on auscultation what will you infer ma'am patient might be having a uh, asthma ma'am any restrictive diseases ma'am can these patients have wheeze without having underlying asthma asthma these patients can have why because of the restrictive pattern ma'am uh, they will not be able to expire uh, properly no it's because of early airway closure okay yes. increased frc so that is why these patients can sometimes have a wheeze so for that what do you need to do to differentiate between the two ma'am pf pf right pf, PF will, will be able to guide you towards that okay fine carry on 
bite side uh, pulmonary function test suppresses breath holding test 45 seconds single breath count 40 forced expiratory time 4 seconds cough test able to cough with moderate strength no productive cough self propagated toxins of coughing abdominal examination on inspection shape generalized fullness pendulous all quadrants moving normally with respiration umbilicus central in position inverted covered by folds of skin no visible scars sinuses or venous prominence no visible lump no visible pulsations peristaltic movements stretch marks present over lower abdomen on palpation inspectory findings confirmed all nine quadrants palpated normally in temperature no superficial tenderness fluid trail or organomegaly tympanic note on percussion shifting dullness not present or auscultation normal bowel sounds heard is the examination of the abdomen going to uh, give you any information which will help you in your anesthetic management ma'am these patients will be having uh, hepatomegaly ma'am so uh, because of fatty infiltration of the liver uh, they will be having hepatomegaly ma'am so how does it affect your anesthetic management ma'am uh, uh, we'll uh, it affects the drugs uh, dosing we we'll, whatever we are giving ma'am clearance of the drugs so even if the patient has fatty liver it may not always be associated with a palpable liver right and in an obese patient it becomes very difficult to palpate the intra abdominal organs so the short answer is that the abdomen really is not going to give you any extra information in this patient who's scheduled for a bariatric surgery okay even though as part of your routine examination you have to say it but it's not really going to affect your anesthetic management okay or it's not going to give you any clue towards management okay fine carry on central nervous system examination patient conscious oriented to time place and person cranial nerve examination with the normal limits speech normal no sensory or motor deficit spine examination on inspection head position and hairline in midline no short neck slight hump was noted curvature of the spine normal no visible scars sinuses or swellings present on palpation local temperature normal no tenderness or any palpable swelling intervertebral space not appreciated so here the examiner is going to ask you why did you palpate the spine because to for regional anesthesia if we want to give any regional anesthesia for that we should palpate so the, the next spine. question is next question is going to be what regional anesthetic technique are you planning for a patient who is scheduled for bariatric surgery sleeve gastrectomy rather right which is a laparoscopic procedure so is it really needed and for this patient it is not needed for ma'am for so no i i agree with what you are saying but if this patient was scheduled for an open surgery or for a non bariatric surgery then where you are planning a neuraxial anesthesia yes but whenever you are presenting a case in the exam you should restrict yourself to that surgery only and not talk about other things because you are unnecessarily wasting your own time because you should be answering questions more than giving out information which is not really required okay just a helpful tip i think it will uh, help you in the exams okay carry on come my provisional diagnosis afsa pervin 36 year old female with grade 3 obesity with hypothyroid and hypertension controlled on medication posted for laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy okay so with this uh, provisional diagnosis uh, what investigations would you like If, when you go for your pre anesthetic checkup what investigations would you like for this patient to have one oh, one thing for one thing one thing the you didn't mention the stop bank score for this patient ma'am stop bank score is 3 ma'am for this patient she is uh, why is it important the stop bank ma score uh, yeah post operative recovery depends on our stop bank score ma'am mm, other than that okay we'll come to this uh, a little later so right now we are at the investigation part so what investigations are you going to ask for in this patient only this patient ma'am i i'll ask for cbc ma'am complete blood count okay and 
i'll ask for uh, so what uh, what do you what are you looking for in cbc can you find abnormality CBC, in cbc in this patient or any obese patient yes ma'am these patients if uh, in severe form of osca they will be having obesity hypoventilation syndrome ma'am in which they will be having polycythemia ma'am so good. to rule out that very uh, good. We'll very good okay fine cbc what else and uh, i'll order for uh, kidney function tests ma'am okay. and i'll order for uh, liver function tests okay and what can you expect I what abnormality can you expect in renal function tests and uh, kidney function sorry in liver function tests in liver function tests ma'am there will be uh, if because of the fatty liver and all we will having deranged enzymes ma'am so so you can have features suggestive of non alcoholic fatty liver disease fatty right liver disease. so to rule that out okay yes. to rule that out you need to have the liver function test then renal function how how are renal functions important ma'am um, these patients will be having hyperuricemia ma'am uh, uric acid levels will be elevated what else and uh, so what does metabolic syndrome do to the kidney if the patient has diabetes not this patient if this patient if obese patients have diabetes and hypertension and coronary artery disease do you think it's going to affect the kidneys also um their renal blood flow will be decreased ma'am yes and they also have a high incidence of diabetic nephropathy or hypertensive nephropathy okay so to rule that out you have to get a renal function test done okay if you understand the logic of getting the test done it will be easier for you to answer because these are routine investigations which all the patients have you really generally look through them but you don't don't understand why we need them in this patient right so if you learn according to that it will be very easier for you to answer very easy for you to answer right okay renal function um, liver function cbc what else and uh, i'll ask for your baseline ecg ma'am and okay. uh, i'll get a chest x ray done ma'am you forgot the sugar uh, fasting blood sugar yes fasting blood sugars and if the and patient is a diabetic you're also like to have sorry hemoglobin levels yeah yes, okay right i'll get a baseline ecg and chest x ray ma'am and uh, i'll so get what a... are you looking for in the ecg ma'am in this patient she is a hypertensive ma'am for past 5 years so she she might be having uh, left ventricular hypertrophy ma'am correct in ecg and uh, these patients mostly will be having low voltage uh, ecgs ma'am and uh, right ventricular hypertrophy will also be there because of osc uh obesity right hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, hypertrophy light right left atrial hypertrophy both can be there okay other than that what else can be there um, bandel branch blocks will be there ma'am dyserythemias arrhythmias will be there correct very good so what kind of arrhythmias are most common in this in these patients atrial fibrillation is most common in this patient very good and and uh, ectopics will be there ma'am uh, pvcs and uh, what else? premature ventricular contract blocks will be there ma'am heart long qt interval can also be there okay so prolonged qt interval and af are some of the common uh, findings in the ecg that you can see which you need to decipher before you take up the patient okay and why do these occur why do why are these patients more prone to arrhythmias because of the fatty deposition uh, on the myocytes ma'am the no. uh, myocytes on sa node ma'am sorry ma'am yes SA. on SA. the conduction system right SA. so that is why they have increased chances of arrhythmias SA. okay fine so ecg what else uh, chest x ray ma'am okay. and uh, we'll get a uh, baseline abg ma'am to uh, to see baseline po2 and pco2 values ma'am okay and we we'll get it 2d echo done ma'am no so abg what are you going to see what are the factors that you are looking for warning signs 
or science Hypo which need uh, optimization? We'll see for any hypoxemia and hypercarbia, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And other than that? We'll see uh, baseline saturation, arterial uh, saturation. That is PO2. No? PO2 will tell you the saturation. PO2 is as good as saturation. Okay. What else? Besides PO2 and PCO2? We'll see the bicarb levels, ma'am. Correct. Very good. Very important. So bicarb levels more than 27. 27. Okay. Will indicate towards what? OS, yeah, ma'am. No, not OSA, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome. Okay? Not all patients who have OSA will have raised bicarbonate levels. Okay. Yes. So obesity, hypoventilation syndrome uh, should be treated before taking up the surgery. And how will you treat it? Ma'am, uh, we'll put a CPAP, ma'am. Correct. For these so patients. these patients who have hypoxia or hypercarbia or have increased serum bicarbonate, they will mm -hmm. uh, need pre-operative CPAP therapy, okay? So for better optimization and lesser post-operative complications. So once their blood gases are optimized, then they should be scheduled for surgery, okay? So it is important to have a blood gas, especially patients who have OSA or severe OSA, right? Okay. And uh, I'll get a 2D echo done, ma'am. Why? Um, uh, to rule out the left ventricular hypertrophy uh, and any valvular diseases, any regional, mo regional wall motion abnormality. And uh, these patients will be having uh, diastolic dysfunction, ma'am, to rule out that. Uh, in what else? What else? Uh, what about the right heart? The right heart, what will happen to the right heart? What, ha what will happen right to the right heart? Right ventricular hypertrophy will be there, ma'am. So, because of that pulmonary hypertension, uh, any pulmonary hypertension. Correct. Rule out that. So right ventricular dysfunction because of pulmonary hypertension, which is commonly seen in patients with? Obesity hypoventilation syndrome, OHS. OSA. OSA, okay. And OHS, obviously. OHS is just a severe form of a patient, uh, uh, OSA seen in patients who have uh, class 4 or class 5 obesity, Okay. So, um, so that is echo ho gaya. And, he, and presence of tricuspid regurgitation are also point you towards pulmonary hypertension, right? So that is a very important factor. Diastolic dysfunction is an important factor. You should not just look at the ejection fraction, which is telling you the systolic function. So you also look at the diastolic function, which actually, if you have uh, deranged diastolic dysfunction, if you have deranged diastole, or you have grade two diastolic dysfunction, then it points towards what? It tells you that the patient has what? Can go into heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. Okay. So heart failure is divided into heart with preserved ejection fraction reduced. and reduced ejection fraction. So patients who have pure systolic dysfunction will have a reduced ejection fraction. These patients generally have more of a diastolic dysfunction. Only in extreme cases will these patients also have left ventricular failure, okay? Or combined left and right ventricular failure. Okay, carry on. What else? Anything and, else? And I will ask for PFT, ma'am, pulmonary function test. Okay. Without any restrictive uh, pattern of the disease. And uh, then I'll ask for serum cortisol levels, ma'am, to rule out uh, Cushing's disease in these patients. If the cause I don't is... think so. That is necessary. So Cushing's disease is already ruled out in these patients. That's why they've come for a bariatric surgery, right? What else? Thyroid function test. I'll get thyroid Fine. function. She's yeah, already hypothyroid. So you need thyroid function test. Very good. What else? Anything else that is left? Yes. I think that more or less covers it. So you've covered everything. Okay, fine. Now, uh, this portion, uh, this patient is scheduled for a sleeve gastrectomy tomorrow. And today you have gone to see her to do a pre-anesthetic checkup. Okay. So uh, what are you going to explain to the patient in terms of risk? The patient is very scared. She says, what risk do I have for this surgery for after my, for doing this surgery? 
do I stand a higher risk of anesthesia? How will you explain it to her? Ma'am, uh, we'll explain uh, the procedure of this uh, surgery, ma'am. We'll explain uh, that she might be having respiratory compromise. Uh, she might go into on ventilatory support if uh, extubation is not smooth. If she is not extubated, she might go, uh, she might be put on ventilator support for some time. More than a ventilatory support, generally these patients do not require ventilatory support. So what support are they likely to require in the post-op? CPAP. Yes, CPAP, okay. Not ventilatory. These, it's a very, it's a laparoscopic surgery. It's not a very major surgery. So uh, most likely you will say that you might require ICU care and along with it, a CPAP. Patients who are already taking CPAP, they are used to it. You have to tell them that you will need CPAP. They will definitely need CPAP in the post-op period. But these patients who are not on pre-op CPAP, in case required, they might be needing CPAP. So you have to explain to them because tolerating CPAP is very difficult for a naive patients, CPAP naive patients. Patients who are already used to it, it's very easy for them, right? So it is good to counsel these patients in the pre-op period that we might put a tight fitting mask on your face, which might be difficult to tolerate, but it is good for your lungs. So you, you need to keep it and not kind of take it away, right? So the first instinct is to take away the mask, right? Okay, so that is one. What else? So pulmonary complications, you, you will tell them that uh, there's chances of desaturation, you might require ICU care, we might give you a CPAP, right? So these are the pulmonary components. Anything else that you would like to uh, tell them about complications or higher risk of complications these patients might have? Mama, what is the uh, about most this? common complication? In, even in class one obesity, these patients stand a higher risk of having this complication. DVT, ma'am. Correct. Very good. So DVT, right? And what is the uh, ultimate complication of DVT? Embolism, ma'am. Pulmonary embolism. So you have to explain to them that since you are have class three obesity, you might you are at a higher risk of having DVT and subsequently PE. Okay. Okay. So that you need to explain. What else? Anything else? Is there a risk a score for these patients to tell them exactly the risk of mortality in the post-op yes. period? Obesity is surgery, uh, uh, mortality risk stratis uh, stratification score is Mortality there. risk score, okay. So what yes. components are there? Uh, <coughs> BMI, ma'am, BMI more than 50 and uh, male gender, ma'am, any hypertension? And uh, and any uh, thromboembolism uh, like pulmonary any risk factors for pulmonary embolism. Any risk factors for pulmonary embolism, ma'am. And uh, okay, so there are five factors, and this patient just has one factor, which is hypertension, right? So she her score is zero to one, and the the risk is about 0.3. Okay, so she stands a very low, low risk of mortality not complications this is a prediction of mortality score right okay. so you can exactly tell us so that is what i was trying to ask you that if the patient says is very scared then what will happen to me after the surgery then you have to tell them that the risk of mortality is 0.3 percent because of whatever we calculated okay and whatever complications you need to explain you will tell them in terms of respiratory complications then you haven't spoken about the cardiovascular complications in case the patient has underlying cardiac illness or has pre-existing arrhythmias, you will also tell them about the cardiac complications, which they can, which can happen in the post-op period or intraoperative period. Okay. Right. So you've explained the risk and uh, what are the pre-op medications you're going to advise in this patient? Ma'am, pre-operatively, we'll uh, put the... Uh, uh... We'll start a thromboembolism prophylaxis in these patients, ma'am, before surgery, 0.4 uh, uh, ml of uh, low molecular weight heparin subcutaneously and to be stopped one day prior to surgery. And uh, we'll start. We'll, uh, tell the patient to continue uh, tablet amlodipine, ma'am, and stop uh, tablet telmisartan before surgery, ma'am. Why? On 
Right. Because it causes profound hypertension, ma'am. So mm -hmm. she start uh, tell me certain, and uh, I'll ask the patient. Why is it and... more important in obese patients, ma'am? After induction, uh, because of the position uh, we are putting the patient, there is already decreased venous return, and uh, because of induction, also there is a vasodilatation causing because of the drugs. and this also uh, causes uh, profound hypertension hypotension so yes and more importantly in sometimes the drug dosing might be difficult in these patients so if you exceed the dose it can cause very precipitous hypotension especially if you are using propofol so anyway in all patients if you continue the ace inhibitors the chances of hypotension is more but even more so in obese patients okay because you may not always achieve the right drug dosing because of the confusions of what um, body weight you are trying to use right it's not very simple the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of anesthetic drugs are not very well researched in obese patients okay so that is why there is a lot of confusion okay carry on then what else <coughs> then i'll ask the patient to continue uh, her thyroid medication on the day of the surgery okay. and i'll i'll ask the uh, i'll put the patient on npvo for more than 8 hours and i'll take a written informed consent ma'am and i'll uh, get a baseline ecg pre op ecg uh, on the morning of that surgery. you've already done do you would you like to give any anti aspiration prophylaxis Yes, ma'am. Anti-aspiration prophylaxis we will give, ma'am. Tablet, uh, band of forty mg on the morning of surgery, okay. and uh, I'll uh, get uh, breathing exercises. I will ask the patient to do uh, deep breathing exercises and pre-operative incentive spirometry, ma'am. Okay. Just a minute, Deepthi. Anu, how much time do I have? We have. Ma'am, we have forty. Four no, minutes. No, no. I have to give ten minutes. Last. Ten Anu minutes is, will be for the moderator to wind up the session. Anu is going to take ten minutes. Anu, how much time do you need for your presentation? Yes, ma'am. How much time you need? I'll, I'll, I'll take ten minutes. Okay. Fine. All right. Okay, Deepthi. Yes, carry on. What were you saying? I'll get the. Uh, I'll ask the patient to do deep breathing exercises and incentive spir spirometry, yeah. ma'am. Oh. So you will coach the patient for about incentive spirometry, right? Okay, very good. And uh, if the patient, uh, this patient is not on CPAP, ma'am. But if the patient is on CPAP, we'll ask the patient to bring the CPAP machine to OT uh, and her her masks to the OT. Why, ma'am? We. pre op in uh, post operatively these patients might need cpap and they uh, they are complement compliant with their uh, machine so we familiar ask, they are familiar uh, with that machine so it is easier for them to use it okay yes, fine okay anything else okay so you explain the risk you've given pre op in what kind of patients would you also like to give uh, ondansetron Not on syndrome. Sorry, um, perinom. Sorry, sorry, perinom. Would you like these patients? G E R D patients will give. Correct. What else? No. If the patient is not giving you a history of reflux, but otherwise, patients who have a long-standing diabetes, okay, they can have no. gastroparesis, and yes. that can induce reflux after induction of anesthesia. so it it would be uh, better to give them a gastroper uh, drug which increases the gastric motility okay right okay carry on then now uh, you given the pre op advice and uh, the next day you are in the operating room what preparation are you going to make before the patient is taken in ma'am before the patient is taken in i will uh, check the anesthesia machine ma'am i will uh, arrange the difficult airway cart ma'am whether it is ready or not and i will and what all will you look for in the difficult airway cart specially ma'am uh, we'll uh, 
see uh, appropriate size face mask is there or not or uh, or uh, oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airways okay. and uh, 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 laryngeal mask supraglottic airway devices are there or not and airway exchange catheter bougie uh, and uh, we'll see for uh, video laryngoscopy and uh, short blades uh, for short handles of uh, for laryngoscopy ma'am and uh, we'll see for uh, we'll arrange a fiber optic uh, bronchoscope ma'am okay what else one important thing you missed supraglottic airway devices i as well you you said that okay sorry i didn't hear okay supraglottic airway devices are very important as rescue airway devices okay would you like to use it as an uh, airway in this patient for the surgery instead of an endotracheal intubation ma'am we, we because it is a laparoscopic surgery uh, there is increased abdominal pressure uh, uh, pressure in these patients ma'am so and also anyway even if it was not a laparoscopic surgery any patient who has a bmi more than 35 it is recommended not to use supraglottic airway device even though even if you have a second generation device okay which because there is increased chances of reflux and aspiration okay. so the the answer is no i would not use a supraglottic airway device as the sole airway device okay as a rescue device it is all right okay fine so you've prepared the airway cart what else ma'am uh, i will uh, see the ot table ma'am mm -hmm. uh, uh, whether it is uh, that will bear the weight of the patient or not and uh, then i will arrange uh, uh, padding uh, i'll arrange for the padding ma'am and uh, pneumatic compression stockings i will keep ready ma'am and and also uh, extension you should be uh, make sure that your table is Uh, a bariatric table okay which can bear the weight of the patient and also some some of the tables have these extensions which can get you can adjust them according to the patient's uh, weight and size right so those are ideal uh, tables for bariatric surgery right and you should have gel gel pads for padding you know and you should also counsel and you should have a team meeting and have adequate staff in the operating room Uh, so that the patient's dignity first of all the patient should uh, dignity dignity should never be hampered because obese patients anyway are very as uh, you know they have a kind of a complex because of their weight and if they are handled if they are not handled in a proper manner their dignity can get affected so everybody in the operating room should be counseled or patient people who are getting bariatric surgery done every day they already know about it right and the second thing is uh, what about the um, you told about the airway cart you told about the the bariatric table and uh, important thing that we missed is that the shifting mechanisms they are adjuncts to shift the patient from the trolley to the bed and from back from the bed to the trolley so do you know of any what over kind of mattresses ma'am uh, and 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 we can ask the patient if she is comfortable she is walking we can ask the patient to comfortably sit on the ot table and self positioning arrange. self positioning is ideal but that can happen only uh, in the pre op period okay in the post op period the patient might not be awake enough to be shifting himself or herself back to the trolley okay so you also have sliders in our hospital we have these sliders which help to shift the patient from the table to the trolley right okay fine so you prepared the ot now next uh, what will you do you taken the patient and the patient is brought to the table how will you position do you will you take any special care for positioning this patient we'll uh, we'll put a ramp ma'am we'll shift the patient we'll put the ramp below the uh, head of the patient uh, so that the head is elevated and uh, abdomen is pushed down because of the ram is and, that uh, is that the purpose of the ram what is the purpose of the ram purpose uh, for uh, adequate uh, ventilation ma'am for uh, laryngoscopic uh, all the accesses are uh, aligned, aligned right so that is the purpose of the ram and what does the ram do 
ramp what sorry ma'am where how do you know that this ramp or this uh, wedge that i have put under the patient is just right what is we'll, the parameter that you look at we'll see the uh, uh, sternal notch and the external auditory meatus are in the same line very right. very good so that is what you are trying to achieve by putting a ramp okay so that all three axes are aligned and you do not have a difficulty in intubation so the other thing that you were saying previously the, uh, that uh, the abdominal contents will be pushed down How, what will you do for that what positioning will you do for that for optimizing the ventilation you optimizing. can do a head up position head up position okay so head up position of the table is different from a ramp right so ramp is for aligning the all three axes of the airway so rear intubation is easy and head up positioning of about 20 degree like you rightly said allows easy movement of the diaphragm pushes the abdominal contents down so they do not cause further compression of the lower parts of the lung okay and lead to atelectasis so that improves the oxygenation correct okay so you position the patient what is the next thing that you will do um, i will attach all the standard asa monitors ma'am correct next uh, next uh, then uh, i will secure an iv access ma'am i'll try to secure an iv access so what what precaution Hello. did you take in that precautions in securing iv access ma'am yes so iv access like you said is difficult here right so uh, how will you optimize the iv access we uh, we'll see uh, we with the help of any infrared probes we'll uh, see uh, the veins ma'am you mean the vein viewer ha uh, vein viewer okay you can keep a vein viewer and other than that because sometimes because of the extra fat subcutaneous fat even uh, a vein viewer may not help you very much so what is one uh, thing that is going to help you an ultrasound okay the ultrasound will help you actually find out the deeper veins especially in the antecubital fossa and uh, help you in taking an iv line because sometimes the superficial veins are not easily visible and they are very tortuous so you should always keep yes. a ultrasound for iv access right okay so you've taken an iv access what else next step what will you do i'll uh, preoxygenate the patient ma'am correct and what is the correct technique of preoxygenation in these patients hello am i not audible am i audible i'm audible yeah audible audible ma'am i was asking you what is the correct technique of preoxygenation in these patients uh, we'll uh, preoxygenate for 3 minutes ma'am okay with what tidal volume uh, breath oh, preoxygenation yes CPAP. yes yes we'll yeah we'll give peep ma'am yes you will give a peep of 5 to 7 or even 10 cm of water depending on the patient's uh, end tidal oxygen is very important in these patient to monitor the end tidal oxygen so you will aim to achieve a end tidal oxygen of more than 90% right okay. before you start in yeah okay so head up position and a uh, cpap of 5 to 10 cm of water and what else can you also enhance your preoxygenation in some other way can you use any other advice uh, device along uh, other than just a face mask we can uh, we can uh, we can para oxygenate the patient also ma'am we can uh... yeah that is there you can use nasal prongs you can use hfnc okay hfnc, HFNC. is often used in these patients so that the patient's uh, oxygen reserve gets better and they do not desaturate very easily okay some people okay. like to use hfnc in these patients right okay fine so you have preoxygenated you have an iv line you have attached the monitors what next ma'am uh, then i'll start with induction ma'am okay uh, i'll give midazolam ma'am 1 mg mm-hmm. and i'll give uh, uh, propofol ma'am according to the body uh, ideal body weight ma'am 
propofol induction dose 2 mg per kg ma'am uh, then i i'll give fentanyl ma'am so what weight are you taking for dosing the propofol for uh, induction ma'am we'll use ideal body weight ma'am for maintenance of propofol we'll give total we use total body weight ma'am so actually instead of using the total body weight because this patient doesn't have a very high body weight it's only 100 okay so this it may not be very uh, pertinent in this patient but if the patients have a very high body weight of 160 170 so it is better to use instead of total body weight adjusted body weight right so that is ideal body weight plus 40% right so that that will prevent you from dosing so the good part of anesthetic drugs is that they can be titrated right so you've reached you've calculated a particular dose and you can titrate it to effect so instead of giving the whole drug you should always titrate it so this titration can happen by what two things not the um, the hemodynamics and you can check whether the patient patient has slept off there is loss of eyelash reflex there is loss of response to verbal command right for propofol and other than that intraoperatively you can dose your uh either inhalation drugs or propofol tci if you are using to to what bis neuromuscular monitoring no yes, bis yes. neuromuscular blockade can be dosed by monitoring the neuromuscular monitoring devices right so that is an advantage of the anesthetic drugs okay that you get so always say that i will calculate the total dose using the ideal body weight or lean body weight here the ideal body weight body weight is adequate or adjusted body weight but i will titrate it to effect so that yes. adds an extra safety margin to those the use of those drugs right okay fine then you've used propofol then then i'll uh, give fentanyl ma'am so i would probably give fentanyl before propofol and the reason for that is because the peak effect of uh, fentanyl is about 3 to 5 minutes and in this patient specially since the patient is a hypertensive i do not i want to obtain the sympathetic response right so i would give it before propofol so that the peak effect coincides with the timing of laryngoscopy and intubation right and it also helps and if you give fentanyl and wait for about 3 minutes and start your induction with propofol the total dose of propofol also reduces right especially especially if you are given midazolam i wouldn't give midazolam in this patient because it would unnecessarily delay the awakening delay the emergence okay emergence right okay then you've given fentanyl you would give propofol what next then i'll uh, use uh, vecuronium mum okay 0.1 mg per kg according to ideal body weight mum right okay then uh, after 3 minutes i'll uh, intubate i'll uh, do intubation laryngoscopy and intubate right as yes. so if uh, on intubation you get a cl grade 3 what are you going to do cl uh, on in, we'll uh, ba- do bag we'll uh, remove the laryngoscope ma'am we'll do uh, bag and mask ventilation okay and uh, uh, we'll we can use a video laryngoscopy ma'am correct okay and if you don't have a video laryngoscope what are you going to do we can use a fiber optic uh, bronchoscope no before that fiber optic is going to take a lot of time what what is the next thing that you can do which is easily available we can ch- uh, we can use a mccoy blade ma'am no you can use a bougie no can't you use a bougie yeah, bougie? yeah. you can use a bougie yes, blind yes. insertion of a bougie but nowadays you, the right answer is using a video laryngoscope since it's so easily available and accessible to everyone so the correct answer would be Uh, a video laryngoscope right okay fine so you've successfully intubated the patient what next maintenance maintenance of anesthesia maintenance of anesthesia i'll put the patient on oxygen and nitrous oxide ma'am with uh, desflurane ma'am 
ma'am. Okay. I okay. use test fluorine, ma'am. Okay. Would you like to? And uh, which one would you prefer? Uh, T uh, Tiva or uh, inhalational agent? I uh, use inhalational agent, ma'am. Why? Because uh, Tiva sometimes uh, the drug dosing uh, because of the drug dosing, ma'am. Uh, the elimination uh, may be dif uh, different in these patients, may be delayed in these patient clearance, may be delayed. So uh, des uh, inhalational anesthetics uh, uh, can be cleared easily from these patients and emergence so, is... Uh -huh. So what the way you need to answer this question is that ideally TIVA is the best, right? Because it decreases the incidence of post-operative nausea vomiting, which is very high in these patients, very, very high. And also it leads, it leads to a better emergence. Right? The patient is more awake. Those are the advantages of TIVA. The downside is that all your TCI pumps are not actually uh, the, the Marsh and Schneider formula, the model is not actually made for weights more than 150 kg. So it may not give you a very reliable dosing. So the chances of awareness might increase or the chances of side effects might increase. So as long as you are careful about these two things, if you're monitoring the BIS and you're taking care of the hemodynamics, you can safely use propofol. As long as you understand the shortcomings or limitations of a TIVA with, uh, with a TCA, using a TCI, right? Ideally, you should use a TCI. If not, if you do not have this, then the other option would be to use short-acting uh, inhalation agents with us with the uh, blood gas part of, uh, partition coefficient which is low such as desflurane and sevoflurane okay fine okay then that is the maintenance right what else anything else you would like to do then, then I will put, uh, put uh, compression stockings ma'am and I will adequately pad the patient cover the patient ma'am all the pressure sites I will uh, cover, ma'am. Right. What about uh, invasive arterial monitoring? Would you like to do insert arterial cannula in this patient? Not needed, ma'am, because uh, she uh, she is having controlled uh, BP and she is okay. not having any uh, ca ca cardiac diseases in uh, correct. And what so? What are needed. the indications? What are the indications? This patient is not required. So in which patients would you like to have an arterial line? Ma'am, in patients of uh, uncontrolled hypertension, ma'am, uh, uh, and uh, in patients of CAD, heart cardiac diseases, and in patients okay. uh, with whom we expect major fluid shifts, ma'am. Correct. Major surgery. What else? Surgery. Any other situation where we would like to have an invasive arterial line? When you do not have an adequately sized blood cough. pressure cuff, okay? So there the monitoring becomes a little difficult. So when we started our bariatric surgery way, way back, initially we were not comfortable. We were not having the right equipment. We used to insert arterial lines in all our patients because it's so much more easier. You have an accurate monitoring of the blood pressure. But now we no longer use it since we already, we now have all the equipment that is necessary. So that is one indication where you might need to put. Sometimes the patient's arm width is so much that even though you have all the cup sizes, it doesn't fit very properly. So that would be one indication for an invasive arterial monitoring. Okay, fine. What else? Anything else? Um, so what are the special uh, uh, needs of this sleeve gastrectomy, which is done only for a sleeve gastrectomy and what precautions do you need to take for it? What is the position position for sleeve gastrectomy? Position of the patient? Reverse, uh, reverse Trendelenburg position, ma'am. Okay. And what else? What are, how are the arms placed? And uh, the arms? Arms are away from the patient, ma'am. And uh, like uh, patient, uh, the surgeon will be standing between the legs, ma'am. Patient's legs will Correct. be uh, spread away, ma'am. Correct. And surgeon will be standing in between. And uh, absolutely. Operating. So it is very important that you strap the patient very well. Okay. Otherwise, yes. there is yeah. risk of injury or slipping of the patient from the table. So you should always mention that also. Okay. Fine. Okay. Then what else? What is the other uh, special need of this surgery? 
you need uh, to insert a operatively we need insert a bougie ma'am yes the surgeon yeah. so the sleeve is actually made around the bougie right so you need to insert a bougie so you have to be very careful during insertion of the bougie what uh, precautions you need to take ma'am uh, sometimes uh, the bougie gets stapled uh, along with the correct uh, so we have to uh, put it in and out uh, during correct. the surgery correct and for the same for the same yes we will see sorry ma'am yeah yeah continue what were you saying we will see uh, uh, we have to see any leak in the uh, suture site also we'll uh, put methylene blue ma'am dye we'll put ma'am to see any leak through the bougie ma'am fine okay so then our surgery is finished and uh, you've reversed the patient any precautions during reversal of the neuromuscular ma'am, block it uh we'll uh, we will reverse the patient uh, we'll give neuromuscular blockage uh, reversal and uh, we'll uh, try our extubation only after the patient is fully awake correct so if you are if you the patient has severe osa any precaution you can take before extubating the patient ma'am we'll uh, cpap ma'am we'll put cpap ma'am so that is after extubation so before extubation uh, I, what i do is i insert a nasopharyngeal airway right oh, so yes, that yes. helps in keeping the airway patent yes. even for application of cpap having a if the patient is drowsy then having a nasopharyngeal airway really helps okay so a nasopharyngeal airway can be inserted and after extubation what what are the precautions that you need to take Ma'am, uh, I'll extubate the patient in head up position, in gram position, ma'am. Yeah. And uh, then I'll put the CPAP machine, uh, CPAP for some time, ma'am. So that is after you shift it to the recovery room. Okay. So yes, you have to take care that the patient is shifted with oxygen supplementation. supplementation. Okay. So you should have an oxygen cylinder or a source for oxygen supplementation. for shifting of transport of patient from the operating room to the recovery room right yes, and as far as possible you should not give 100% oxygen for very long why uh, these patients are more prone for apnea ma'am uh, no. even if no it's not for apnea it is basically to prevent absorption at electrolysis if you give these patients already have basal electrolysis if you give them 100% oxygen for a very long time it leads to absorption at electrolysis which worsens the post operative hypoxia right so give 40% or 50% but not 100% right okay and then once you shift to the recovery what are the precautions that you need to take ma'am uh, we will put uh, we'll see whether the patient is conscious ma'am and uh, able to follow our commands so we'll monitoring so monitoring proper monitoring and uh, so cpap apnea oxygen therapy cpap and hfnc if possible okay yes. and the main thing that you have to take care in the post operative period is the pain two things pain and pnb very important okay and the, the why do you need to take care of these two pain and pnb that pain is important in causes hyper this pain and pnv is important in all the patients but especially so in obese patients undergoing bariatric surgery why because we pain. need to ambulate them as early as possible mobilization is the first thing that you need to early mobilization so by evening if the surgery is finished in the first half by evening they are made to sit up and walk a few steps because like i told you the most important complication or most frequent complication is dvt right so to prevent dvt the best way is to do early mobilization right return of gastric function return of the intestinal function mobilization is the key to early recovery so if the patient is having a lot of nausea vomiting which anyway these patients are very prone to so uh, if you don't take you don't give adequate uh, anti no anti vomiting prophylaxis or anti vomiting medication anti emetic medication so these patients will not be able to ambulate or mobilize right so they have to get down the clock sorry 
so they have to get round the clock uh, antiemetic medications in the form of ondansetron right and perinom if required okay and this has to be continued for almost 4 to 6 weeks in the post op period right okay so pain one last thing how will you manage the pain in this patients in this in these patients ma'am uh, for pain uh, intra uh, post operatively after completion of sur surgery we can uh, local infiltration of the surgical site ma'am and uh, then we can use uh, nsaids ma'am and uh, paracetamol we can use ma'am paracetamol okay so 1 gram 6 hourly of paracetamol local infiltration is very important it adds so multimodal analgesia so you cannot rely on opioids in these patients because because it they have a high risk of osa they have a high risk of Respected having apnea and desaturation in the post op period so multimodal analgesia in the form of pcm nsaids and local infiltration with local anesthetics right okay thank you i think we have reached a time thank you so much deepthi you did a excellent job very well done thank you ma'am thank you dr vimi ma'am for covering in detail all the aspects of bariatric surgery thank you dipti for a very good case presentation now i'm be quickly summarizing the uh, important features uh, related to anesthesia for bariatric surgery and before we can after that we can take up the questions so who describes uh, overweight and obese as the excessive accumulation of fat which poses a health uh, risk and surgery which is done for a morbidly obese patient is called as the bariatric surgery so uh, the factors which influence the obesity can be genetic behavioral cultural socio economic factors and metabolic factors uh, this is a pyramid which shows uh, how how we, we can assess the uh, the obesity if the very accurate method can be mri but it is very difficult for each patient to be performed in the pre op so bmi weight and body mass index is more easy but it may not be as much accurate so uh, most widely accepted assessment is by the bmi which is the patient's weight divided by patient's height and scale so this is how we classify the obesity as you can see in class 2 the bm uh, class 3 40 and above is an indication for bariatric surgery in the class 2 with the bmi of 35 to 39 along with the comorb comorbidities is also an indication for bariatric surgery and as very as very well dipti told uh, the waist and the hip ratio is important and uh, in an obese patient uh, more than 102 cm waist uh, circumference has a very high risk of complications okay and then the metabolic syndrome was also discussed in detail so with the features of metabolic syndrome are abdominal obesity dyslipidemia high blood pressure insulin resistance pro, uh, pro inflammatory state as you know uh, obesity is a pro inflammatory state pro thrombotic state so these are the criteria for metabolic syndrome the way circumference plus any two of these two uh, these uh, four criteria triglycerides hdl blood pressure and fasting glucose triglycerides of more than 150 high uh, hdl of less than 40 blood pressure and fasting glucose these are the systemic disorders and the health risks which are associated with obesity so metabolic syndrome type 2 diabetes risk is very high in these patients they these patients have five times uh, risk of having hypertension and 66% of hypertension is linked to excess weight coronary artery disease and stroke this is the effects on the other system respiratory system i will go in detail in a while they are more prone to cancers many of them suffer with infertility and they are more prone to liver and gall bladder diseases so this is how uh, so in the central nervous system they the decrease central respiratory drive osa and ohs i'll tell you in a while airway they can be potential difficult airway obstructive sleep apnea cardiovascular they can be uh, coronary artery disease congestive cardiac failure they have difficult vascular access and difficult positioning this is what uh, are the changes in the anatomical airway in the anatomy of the airway as you can see there is increased dorso cervical fat of uh, fat pad and this excessive uh, deposition of fat especially in the soft palate epiglottis and base of the tongue 
which can cause difficult mask ventilation and it can also contribute to difficult laryngoscopy. So here you can see that in a apneic uh, in an apneic subject how the uh, it can cause collapse of the air. The tongue volume is more, and there is excess of fat deposition as compared to a normal patient. In the respiratory system, there is decrease in the FRC, expiratory reserve volume, vital capacity, lung compliance, closing capacity. This can all lead to decrease in the safe air apnea period time, as Mav had correctly told. So this is important for us too. So it can cause restrictive lung disease, OHS, OSA, or pulmonary. So here in the graph, you can see that the airway closure can begin early in patients who are obese and furthermore in under anesthesia and in the uh, so my, uh, under anesthesia further the airway closure occurs even uh, earlier. So the FRC is decreased. So OSC is a condition which is characterized by recurrent episodes of partial or complete upper airway collapse. It is defined as complete cessation of airflow during breathing lasting for 10 seconds or more despite maintenance of a neuromuscular ventilatory effort by the patient. So duration of more than 10 seconds and more than 5 in an hour. Saturation can fall, should fall more than 4%. So this is uh, the stop bank questionnaire. It is important to, uh, uh, these are the five, eight questions which are asked. If the yes, there is yes to any more than three questions, the risk of obstructive sleep apnea is high. So this is a questionnaire which we should ask in the examination and history. So, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, hypoapnea syndrome, the diagnosis can be made by the uh, polysomnography and nocturnal oximetry. And episodes of 5 to 15 per hour is a mild disease and about more than 30 indicates a severe disease of OSA, apnea, hypopnea syndrome. So they, these patients have more risk of developing systemic and pulmonary hypertension, more risk of developing left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiac arrhythmias, and cognitive impairment. So CPAP is an effective technique for them. It should be started in the pre-op, and it can be also continued in the post-op. More importantly is the OHS syndrome. So not all the OSA patients will develop OHS. About 5 to 10% of patients of OSC in long term will develop OHS, which is characterized by presence of obesity and having awake arterial hypercapnia of more than 45 and as Mav very well told, bicarb of more than 27. So it can ha have all these effects uh, on the systems. Cardiovascular system. So there is an increase in the total blood volume. Cardiac output can increase up to 20 to 30 ml per kg. It can accelerate atherosclerosis. In the ECG, the uh, high risk of arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, as ma'am told, there, is, there are low QRS voltages, there are left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, and prolonged QT interval. So weight loss can reverse many of these ECG abnormalities. So this is a, a flowchart which is showing that how uh, obesity can lead to biventricular failure. Increased pulmonary blood volume can cause hypertension, increased RV workload and RV hypertrophy can lead to right ventricular failure. And increased cardiac output, increased left ventricular workload, and hypertrophy can cause left ventricular failure. So patient can have biventricular failure. This is an um, HA algorithm for uh, if a patient of uh, the obesity, how to, if they have a ischemic heart disease. So as you, here you can see if the patient is of very low risk, they can proceed with the planned surgery. If there's a one risk for coronary artery disease, 12 lead ECG can be sufficient. If a patient has good, good functional capacity, also you can proceed with the planned surgery. Only if the patient is unable to exercise or his exercise capacity is unknown, an imaging technique like echocardiography is recommended. And if the echo shows there is left ventricular systolic function uh, is decreased, that means patient can have obesity, cardiomyopathy, or hibernating myocardium. So he can be considered for a angiography. On a GI system, there is this decrease, there is a delay in the gastric emptying. So anti-aspiration prophylaxis can be given to these patients. They're also at increased risk of severe aspiration pneumonitis. Also, as ma'am rightly told, there are abnormalities of liver fatty infiltration. So there's a high prevalence of non-alcoholic stereohepatitis, uh, that is NASH. Fatty infiltration will also 
it, it, it reflects the duration of the obesity rather than the uh, degree of the obesity. The most common enzyme, which is uh, abnormality, is increased in the ALT. So, in the renal system also, excess weight gain can cause increase in the renal tubular absorption and can impair the naturists. With increased obesity, there can be loss of the nephron functions. In the endocrine system, there is they are more prone to developing type 2 diabetes mellitus. They have abnormal glucose tolerance tests. Hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, and diabetes will further predispose them to having wood infections and increase the myocardial infarction. So, preoperatively, management of the hyperglycemia is important. They can also have subclinical hypothyroidism, which may be associated with hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, and impaired hepatic drug metabolism and metabolic syndrome, as I've already told. One more important thing is psychiatric disorders. Many of them can have psychiatric disorders like depressive, anxiety disorders, binge eating is quite common. So this, these should also be evaluated in the pre-op uh, pre period. And uh, pre-surgical psychopathology uh, can impair post-surgical outcomes. So these have to be given importance before surgery. Post-surgical weight loss can improve their cognitive function. So they should be evaluated for a psychiatric workup also. These are the various surgeries that that is being that is done. So they can be uh, our patient was posted for sleeve gastrectomy, other are gastric banding and gastric bypass. It is to NY gastric bypass. Most commonly, gastric sleeve is being done. Anesthetic management, the pre-op history and examination should be taken in detail. The drug history, knowledge of the surgery which was last performed, any implantable gastric stimulator, how much is the patient's uh, mobility his meds, is he able to tolerate the supine position, what is his dumea saturation, what is the, whether he uses a CPAP in the pre-op or not. And also the comorbidities, GRD, hypertension, diabetes, OSA, all these are to be evaluated. So pre-op weight loss regimens, generally these patients are put on a pre-op weight regimen with the, the low calorie uh, diet, about 800 kilocalories per day. This can decrease the liver volume by 16 to 20 percent. So these are the investigations which I've already discussed in detail, ma'am. Ma so in the pre-op period, it is important that it, is, it should be a multidisciplinary team approach, including the surgeons and the anesthetists and the psychologist. So patients who are on CPAP can get their own CPAP machines in the post for the post-op period. So CPAP machines, if it is used for two weeks, can correct the abnormal ventilatory effect. And within three to six months, there can be reduction in pulmonary hypertension. I'll just take five more minutes. So this was a risk. Uh, this is an obesity surgery mortality risk score, which Madam had told. So this is this predicts the post-op mortality. And this can be explained to the patient to allay his anxiety. So if a score of more than four to five should be considered for post-op admission to HDO, uh, HDO or ICU, our patient was having a score of around one. So his post-op mortality risk is very low. Pre-medication, usually all, all the medications are continued in the pre-op except the insulin and the OHAs. Antibiotic prophylaxis and anti-aspiration prophylaxis is to be given. Very importantly, DVT prophylaxis can be given as per the institutional protocol. Here we give uh, inoxaparin 40 milligrams subcutaneously every 12 hours, or it can be uh, it should be stopped before surgery. Also, uh, DVT pumps are to be used in the intraoperator. This is a formula for the total body weight, lean body weight, and adjusted body weight, as has already been discussed. So, lean body mass is uh, is the one which is most often used for obesity for drug dosing. It is the mass of the non-adipose tissue. So this is a table which is given in Miller's. So the propofol induction can be done based on the lean body weight. Infusion on the adjusted body weight. And for the total body weight, drugs like scolin and uh, low molecular weight heparin can be used. Patient can self-position himself on the operating table. And the inflatable hover mattresses are commonly used to shift the patient. And also the roller blades can also be used. So the arms and their body should be well padded. Reverse Schindler-Berg position is the one which is used. So in this, uh, how it is positioned, as you can see over here. So from the external, this is a ram. 
ramp should be positioned such that the external auditory meatus and the sternal knot should be in the one line it should be parallel to the ground so this is the surgical position and uh, important here to note is that tissue necrosis and compression can can cause compartment syndrome and rhabdomyolysis in these patients so positioning pressure points padding is of very much importance tidal volumes of around 6 to 8 ml per kg can be given in emerge rapid recovery and good airway control is important extubation should be done in head up position also important is that lung recruitment uh, should be done before extubation and so that uh, and cpap is to be maintained uh, for the atelectasis prevent oxygenation should be uh, uh, monitored adequate analgesia regional regional anesthesia or multipodal analgesia to be maintained nowadays the emphasis is more on opioid sparing analgesia for these patients post operatively risk of uh, nausea vomiting is very high so this has to be taken care of peri operative use of regional anesthesia intraoperative non opioids and anesthetic adjuvants to be used dexmed dexmedetomidine can be used for them and local infiltration also so these are the post op complications <coughs> nastomotic leak is one of the feared complication for the bariatric surgeon it is more common if the bmi is more than 50 and patient has metabolic syndrome Thank you. So we'll take up the questions now. Doctor Nitin, do we have questions? And we have one question. Doctor Nitin, do yeah. we have questions? And we have one question. 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 It is regarding the myths. Okay. So it's uh, Nitin. The hello. hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Nitin? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, ma'am. Yeah. So METS is uh, a way of actually uh, assessing the patient's exercise tolerance, but in obese patients, often this may not be very uh, useful or possible because because of the excess body weight, they may not be able to exercise one or do the required amount of. exercise and secondly often these patients also have osteoarthritis so their exercise their activity may not actually translate into adequate estimation of meds so sometimes if these patients have a high risk of coronary artery disease it's better do a stress echocardiography and stress echocardiography here is going to be a pharmacological stress echocardiography like dobutamine stress so meds here it's very good if the patient is is mobile and is able to give you a exact estimate of uh, your their activity then you can say yes the patient is has meds more than 4 but if not if the patient has class 3 class 4 class 5 obesity it is often not possible to estimate meds so there especially if the patient has metabolic syndrome which often these patients have it is better to do a, a non invasive uh, cardiac test to evaluate the coronary function does that answer your question yeah wind up it does ma'am we don't have any more questions ma'am in the chat box so, all right we can, okay yeah. we can okay. wind up thank you so much everyone and thank, thank you deepi and anu for the excellent coordination and very well presented case thank, thank you ma'am and good luck for your exams deepi thank you ma'am thank you okay thank, thank you ma'am thank you thank you for being there and for such an elaborate and informative discussion on such an important aspect most welcome thank most you, welcome okay thank you anupama ma'am for a wonderful presentation thank you dr nitin so we'll move on to our next session can we have the cds yeah so for our next session i would like to invite dr lokesh kashyap sir is director professor sir is professor and head of the department at uh, department of anesthesia aims new delhi and sir's area of special interest are airway management pain management thoracic and bariatric surgery we welcome you sir and i would hand over the proceedings of the session to you sir uh good morning uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, so this is the 
This session is by Dr. Ashat Tyagi, who is a director pro professor at UCMS and GTB Hospital. Uh, her area of interest is obstetric and physiocritical.